Welcome to the Potter Blog site. It's Thursday, October 13th, 2011. Have a uh, and another maximum alert to release. We've had an, another Neptunium 239 uh, indication in the fallout from yesterday's rainstorm of 10-12-2011. Uh, as frequent as these things have started to become, uh, I hate to keep marking them uh, maximum alert, but uh, Neptunium-239 changes into Plutonium-239, so it warrants it. But if this continues, I'm going to have to change from these uh, warnings from maximum alert to uh, snafu alert, which would stand for uh, situation normal, all fukushima up. So what I'm going to go over first is the... Uh, just show up the graph very quickly of uh, the detection and then I'll go immediately into uh, showing which part of the country was uh, uh, most likely hit by this uh, Neptunium 239 and then I'll get into some detail of the uh, math of the detection. Uh, so first uh, we'll look at this real quickly. Here's the uh, longer half-life component of this detection. Uh, the short half-life component was uh, 25 times greater than background and it was a uh, radon 222 daughters. Uh, we believe those come from uh, the groundwater at Fukushima, which is heavily laden with uh, radon, especially in earthquake zones, and from uh, nuclear fission occurring in the groundwater and steaming up radon. So the uh, radon is a, in essence a, a canary in the coal mine that uh, gives us indications of uh, when uh, the more dangerous, harder to detect longer half-life uh, fallout is contained in the, uh, in the rain. Uh, short what we have here is uh, uh, the sample was taken at 6.45 p.m. on 10.12. Uh, this particular section of this reading was started on 10.13 approximately 1.56 in the morning and ended on 10.13 approximately 1.41 in the afternoon. These are 90 second averages uh, counts per second. Uh, we do an exponential curve fit which gives us this value where from which we can detect uh, calculate the half-life 2.4 day half-life. Uh, it's indicative of Neptunium 239 uh, that however there still are some uncertainties but there's not too many candidates that uh, fit this uh, fallout half-life and they're all on the fact that uh, there's been large detections of Neptunium-239 in Japan and it becomes uh, really close to a lock. But now let's go to uh, showing where this fallout hit. Uh, this is a jet stream. This is uh, the actual jet stream historical data. This is not a simulation. And what I've done is I've run it for the last seven days. I'll start it up here in a second, but just to orientate you. Uh, dead center of the map, North Pole. Down here we have uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and over here if we follow across we have Fukushima. And I'm going to start this up and you can see how, how the uh, jet stream comes in. And if we watch this section, it comes over and then it comes in right and hits St. Louis right there. So this is the section to be wary of. If you had any rainfall in uh, your neck of the woods, that was associated with this glob of the jet stream uh, more than likely have uh, some significant Neptunium-239 and plutonium fallout in your area. If you notice it hits the uh, Midwest and the Northwest pretty bad. And if you'll see here it's actually only a glancing blow to uh, St. Louis, Missouri which is why I believe the uh, detection was only 25 times greater than background and not a hundred times better, greater than background or 200 times greater than background and those levels we've had in the last two months from when the uh, jet stream was directly overhead when we had rainfall. So let's zoom in here we'll go directly to the United States and we'll start it off I think on October 10th but again this is October 8th comes in swaths across the country so let's get a closer zoom and here where we'll start at is October 10th, uh, 1800 hours Zulu time, which is Greenwich, which I believe is six hours ahead of St. Louis. So this would have been uh, 12 o'clock in the afternoon on October 10th, uh, St. Louis time. I believe that's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning uh, Pacific time. 
So this is the blob to watch here. If you had any rain come out of this blob, a jet stream as it moves across the country, uh, I would expect contamination. So I'm going to start it. Let's see where it comes in. And again, if you'll notice, it does not directly hit St. Louis. We only got a glancing blow. But it uh, did hit significant portions of uh, the grain belt. It's like it even got some to California. Uh, some reason Seattle gets hit pretty hard with all these. And there's no telling where it's going to go to next. But uh, these are what I call the danger zones. And if you had, again, rainfall come out, while this jet stream was overhead in your area, then I think it's a prudent risk mitigation uh, action to uh, take some precautions. Uh, probably the primary one, primary one I would suggest is uh, before bringing your vehicle into your garage or any habitable location, uh, take it through a brushed car wash to uh, wash off all the uh, surface contamination. Uh, unfortunately, that's only a mild thing we can do. You know, we're pretty much stuck with this fallout until somebody decides to do something about it that's effective and let's go to the uh, the math of the detections and I'll show you the all-up detection here and we've got multiple things going on here uh, this is the short half-life section and we've determined that was uh, the daughters of uh, radon 222 uh, radon 222 decay products and all these blue colors you see here these are the actual readings. The blue colors are the actual readings. You can see it breaks into two sections, the short half-life section, and there's a gap where I was setting up for the longer half-life section. And on the short half-life section, these are counts per second average, and they're averaged over a 30-second time frame. Over here on the longer half-life section, these uh, count, average counts per second are over a 90-second time frame. And this red line here is the uh, calculated level of radon daughters one would expect and you can see that it decays out to uh, uh, undetectable levels right around the 400 minute mark and that's when we started uh, uh, doing our measurements of the longer half-life radiation uh, this red line down here is the average background radiation during that day and this faint green line is the uh, projected levels of neptunium 239 that come out of this uh, longer half-life detection. Now what I'm going to do here is uh, zoom in on this section so we can get a little more detail, see what's going on. So we've cut off the top of the chart. Again here on the left is the short half-life section, uh, average counts per second over 30 second periods. Uh, this is a longer half-life section, uh, 90 second counts, uh, average counts per second. And then we have a gap here in the middle where we didn't take any uh, readings because we were making a setup change. Uh, this red line is the what we would expect out of radon daughters and you can see it decays out to almost zero level after 400 minutes the sort of pink purple line is the background radiation and you can see our long half-life detection is uh, above the average background and the short half-life radiation is well above the average background we call that signal to noise so all this blue is the uh, signal and down here the purple is the average noise level. Uh, this green line here is the uh, Neptunium 239 decay curve that we've calculated out from this section. And the key things to notice are is before we started uh, measuring the longer half-life we waited until all the short half-life stuff would have decayed out. And if you can still see there's still a pretty good gap between the uh, net average Neptunium levels and uh, the average background levels. So really right here in this zone from about 400 minutes to about 1100 minutes is really the best sweet spot we have for taking a direct reading of this radioactivity and calculating a half-life uh, from a curve, from an exponential curve fit of this data. And what happens is as this uh, Neptunium 239 starts to decay lower and lower and starts to get closer and closer to this background radiation, becomes a lot harder to differentiate signal for no from noise. And, <clears throat> excuse me. One way we get over that is we start taking longer and lo longer counts. Uh, right now, uh, you may be able to hear the Geiger counter in the background, uh, we're taking counts over a 15 minute period and that should give us a little bit better resolution over the noise but it also gives us uh, less detail of the exact uh, quantity. So past this point here 
as we go further out, it becomes, it becomes harder to nail down what the half-life is, but we can still say with some relative certainty that we're getting uh, radioactivity uh, above background levels. So that's in essence is the math of this detection and what we've done. So let's go on to the uh, Neptunium-239. So this is from the long half-life section. And this is uh, approximately a 12 hour reading. And again, 90 seconds. And when you do a curve fit to this, you get this exponential curve with these values. And it gives us a 2.4 day half-life. And as I said earlier, there are not too many perspective uh, fallout contaminants with a 2.4 day half-life in the neighborhood of 2.4 days that uh, would give us this reading. So it's a, it's a strong indication of Neptunium-239, but it's not a certainty. But it is definitely strong enough that it's actionable from a risk mitigation standpoint. And fortunately, the things we can do to uh, mitigate this risk are, are limited. Yeah, I think the, the best risk mitigation is truly is to pray. Thank you and good night.